In the name of Allah, gracious and merciful, may peace be upon you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for being with us. In this session, we will discuss 2022 Qatar World Cup and international relations revisited. As Simon Chadwick will discuss his uh, paper entitled Discourse on the Qatar World Cup Sports New Geopolitical Economy as he described sports as a geopolitical economy which was reflected in which the tournament was framed across the world mm. and uh, in the GCC and in Qatar in particular. Professor Chadwick is a professor of sport and geopolitical economy at Schema Business School in Paris and he is also uh, where he is also a think tank uh, publica. He has been regular visitor to the Gulf for 15 years and worked with the Supreme Committee and delivery and legacy during Qatar's operation for the World Cup. He undertook research, writing consultancy and advisory work in uh, diverse fields, ranging from marketing and commercial strategies to soft power and diplomacy. His latest book, The Geopolitical Economy of Sport, Power, politics, money, and the state. Al Iqtisad, Al Geo Siasi, Al Riyadha, Al Sulta, Al Siasi. Dr. Simon will join us uh, uh, virtually via Zoom. Minutes, uh, to present your paper. The floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good day everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm really disappointed that I can't be there because uh, I can already see that some of my very old friends are in the audience today, um, but I look forward to uh, to next time. And uh, looking ahead to what's to come, I, I send greetings for, uh, for the forthcoming uh, Ramadan period as well. Um, if I could share my screen before I start, if that's uh, okay. So as already mentioned, I work at Schema Business School in Paris. Um, you can see my details there. I don't tweet about my lunch. I tweet about the geopolitical economy of sport and, and other such things. But I guess the first thing to, to say is I am a British guy working in France. So already today, I've heard people talking about Britain and talking about France and, and how that part of the world um, engaged with and, and, dare we say, consumed the World Cup. And what I also want to say is, is um, I've got German and Norwegian heritage as well. So I am absolutely a North European. And of course, therefore, a lot of my World Cup experience uh, over the last two months, two years, um, has been filtered through this ongoing dialogue, actually not a dialogue, more of a monologue about the Qatar World Cup that has presented um, the tournament, the country, uh, its people, the Arab world, Islam, the Middle East more generally, in, in very, very specific and particular ways. Now, I don't want to revisit those, those ways of talking about um, uh, all of those people and, and, and entities that I've just mentioned. I'll do that in a short while. But I think what was really striking about uh, the early parts of today's conferences is somebody actually used the phrase, and I, and I wrote down the question. I think it was one of the, the, the last questions just before the coffee break. Um, who decides? Who decides what are the fundamental human rights and what was really significant, I think, about that question for me is, is that as a British guy working in France with German and Norwegian heritage, I found myself over the last two months, over the last two years, over a longer period of time, really in, in very difficult and challenging situations. Now, the first time that I visited Qatar um, was 2009. And one of the things that we've not mentioned uh, today um, thus far, which I think is really important, is 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 the Qatar the successful Qatari bid to host the World Cup came at a time when um, the Western world, in inverted commas, and I'm going to put that heavily in inverted commas because I'll come back to that later. The Western world was still preoccupied with its war on terror, and 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 I think that one of the 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 the, dim the dimensions that helped shape people's perceptions of Qatar. Yes, it was about football culture and, and yes, it was about FIFA corruption and lots of other things, but there was considerable um, 
anti-Middle Eastern sentiment, I think, at the time, certainly in, in the Western world, relating to, for example, the likes of a Qatar bid for the World Cup. Now, the reason for telling you this is because when I when I first visited the Gulf, as I mentioned, um, and first visited Qatar, it was against this backdrop. And I I questioned, I questioned whether I should actually be traveling to the region or not. But I have to say that I'm glad that I did because Qatar has had a profound effect on me. It's had a profound effect on the way that I see the world. And I hope that it will have a profound effect upon the way in which we teach, research, write about and think about sport. Because one of the things that, that I did um, and I've been to Qatar many, many times. I was trying to remember how many, many times, maybe 50 or 60 times now I've been in Qatar. Sometimes I would be in Qatar for two weeks every month at some at one stage. Um, but as you can imagine, as, as, a, as a British guy working in France with Norwegian and German heritage to find myself suddenly the, in the Albida Tower on the Corniche as a director of research for the Qatar World Cup, um, I was really excited Clearly, I, you know, people were always very nice to me, very hospitable, very respectful. But what I got to do is, 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 is to think about the world, to see the world and to think about the world in completely different ways. Now, I know I, <clears throat> I know that Mafoud Amara from uh, Qatar University may still be in the audience. And, and, and Mafoud will know on social media just before uh, the World Cup, somebody challenged me on social media to explain why I felt that Qatar had changed my life. And hopefully what I'm going to do today as I go through this presentation is to, to provide you with an indication of, of, of why, because I think there is a, a knowledge legacy that, that for me personally has been one of the major outcomes of, of, of the tournament. But as I say, in terms of how I see the world, um, really, really important. The one thing that I would add just as a, as a brief aside is at the same time as I was traveling to Qatar, I was also traveling to, to Saudi Arabia and to United Arab Emirates, but also to places like China and to Russia. And what it appeared to me is that there was a very different way of seeing the world to the way in which I'd been told you know, during that decade, 2000 to 2010, the way in which I'd been told by, by the media in Britain and elsewhere in Europe or the Western world to see the World Cup, the region, and, and I think the world in general. And so this led to me um, creating or, or, or conceiving of sport in, in a way that I now call the geopolitical political economy of sport. What's really significant from an academic perspective is, is the prevailing European literature on sport tends to have a very sociocultural orientation. Um, the prevailing literature on sport that's coming out of, North, that his, historically has come out of North America, it's got a very kind of economic and industrial uh, basis to it. Now, I'm not saying that in the 21st century, set in the context of the Qatar World Cup, that the sociocultural significance of sport is not important. Clearly, it, clearly it is. Nor am I saying that the economic and industrial dimensions of, of sport are no longer relevant or important. Clearly, they are. <clears throat> but what I think, having spent time in Qatar, is significant is to understand this additional political dimension, but also the geographic um, dimensions of how we think about and write about and teach about and research about sport. And so this has resulted in me conceiving of um, this geopolitical economy of sport in these terms. It's this interplay between multiple different forces. And although I've put a Qatari flag on the left-hand side of the screen there, and you can see the National Museum, this is not just about Qatar. It's not just about Qatar. It's also about Saudi Arabia. And it's also about China. And it's also about Russia. But it's also about France and Britain and the United States and Brazil and South Africa and Nigeria so essentially what I'm arguing or contending now, not just in this presentation, but more widely, is to see sport in a different way. The way we saw sport, the way we conceived of sport in the 19th and 20th centuries um, is increasingly outdated. 
So one of the knowledge legacies, and there is a direct line of causality from Qatar to this book, is every day when I sit in the Albeda Tower um, drinking cardamom coffee and looking out of the window across the uh, across to the Corniche, and you know, very often there'd be powerboat racing or whatever else it was taking place in in uh, just by the Corniche. I would be thinking about what is it about this world? What is it about this world? And this book, which will be published shortly, is I think our and I say our. It's a community of people how we see the world now. There is a section on um, on the Gulf region. Uh, Mafood, uh, who I hope is in the audience, has written. Um, I've also written a chapter. I've written a chapter specifically on sport washing, and I'll, I'll come to sport washing in, in a short while. But if Qatar wants a knowledge legacy um, as a result of the hosting the World Cup, no, please, please do see this as a, as, a, as, a, as a knowledge legacy. And one of the features, I think, of, of this geopolitical economy of sport is um, the global pivot that is currently taking place. And, and and I'll say a little bit more about the global pivot, because I don't like the term the Western world. Um, I also have some discomfort or unease about thinking about East and West, because if you, know, if, if you sit in downtown Doha thinking about the world, downtown Beijing is actually quite a long way away. Downtown Doha is closer to downtown Paris and downtown London you know, rather than to downtown Beijing. So I don't like these distinctions between East and West. I don't like the characterization of the, the Western world. What I am going to do in terms of talking about the pivot is, is, is to address um, how we should perhaps talk about the world as it is today. But clearly what we know about our world today is this post-World War II US hegemonic order, rules-based order that was created um, is now being challenged significantly, being challenged by the rise of China, being challenged by, for example, the ambitions of, of Russia, being challenged by uh, the needs and aspirations of countries in the Gulf region. And so we no longer live in a, in a monopolar a world. We, we, we don't live in a, in a, if I can use the term bipolar, although perhaps that suggests something else. And what we live in is a multipolar world. And what, for me, Qatar 2022 did was to bring the realities of, the, the, the multi, of our multipolar geopolitically economic world into the living rooms of audiences globally. And the simple conclusion to this, and I'll get to this at the end, is for many people, this was a shock. And so the narratives and discourse that we've seen uh, in response to Qatar's hosting of the World Cup is, I think, in one part, is the shock of one part of the world responding to this change, but also a reflection of another part of the world feeling empowered and emboldened to represent themselves more vigorously in a particular way. But of course, what's the, what this has done is to create framing issues. I have to say that the period from early October to, to late December for me was the hardest period of my entire working life. I spoke to media outlets from all over the world, all over the world. Um, you know, the, the, the array of different countries that, and to whose journalists I spoke was incredible. And my general response to people, for example, when The Guardian called me up and talked about sport washing, I said to them, I don't want to talk about sport washing because that's your framing. That's not mine. And, and, and I think that what we saw in the lead up to the World Cup, but what we're seeing too, I think, even now, if we look at, for instance, Saudi Arabia's investment program in sport, which many of you will know is immense. I repeatedly, including just this morning, get journalists call up and, and call up and, and they want to talk about sport washing. And I refuse to, to, to talk about sport washing because that's your framing, not mine. So what I want you to, to think about is a multipolar world in which geopolitical economy, in my opinion, is a better characterization of sport has led to framing issues 
And we absolutely saw those framing issues um, when the World Cup came along. And my stock response to, to many journalists when the World Cup was taking place was when they asked me, how do you think? About, what, what do you think about sport washing? Um, what do you think about immigrant worker rights? What do you think about the universality of human rights? Uh, what do you think about governance and ethics in sport? And my response was, it really depends in whose living room you're sat. Because seen from, seen from a living room in Shanghai, the whole issue of sport washing is very different to when seen from a living room in Paris or a living room in New York or a living room in Rio de Janeiro. And I found the, uh, the armband issue uh, an interesting one because in our multipolar world, where multiple different countries believe they have a degree of power and are therefore able to exercise that power in terms of being able to influence discussion, debate, and, and also the outcomes of um, a controversy like armbands. You know, we really saw that whereby the, the Western world viewed the armband uh, issue in one way, but the Arab world viewed the armband issue in another way. Now, I go back to the person who asked the question before the last coffee break, who decides? Who decides? And, and I think that, that, that questioner, she actually said, well, maybe we just can't agree. So at this point, I'm not about to say, well, you know, this is the solution to the armband debate. But very clearly what we had here, you know, in simple terms, it's just, a, it's just a strip of material that goes around somebody's arm. That's all it is. But what we did is we, this was imbued with meaning and it was in, imbued with um, interpret notions of interpretation and power. And clearly it meant very different things to different people. And what I'm always interested in is, is if you were a sport governor. So, for example, if you were the president of FIFA leading and managing an organization, governing world football, how do you how do you make decisions in a multipolar world? So I think one of the outcomes, again, for Qatar of what took place during the tournament is it's raised some really profound questions about governing, leading, managing sport in a multipolar world. Now, how we do that, clearly there are issues of power and influence and control. But in practical or more tangible terms, there are still issues that, that FIFA and others need to get to grips with. So geographically... In terms of my geopolitical economy, geographically, the geography of discourse around the World Cup, I think, was very, very different, reflecting hegemony, power, influence, control, uh, historical position in the world, um, degree of influence over organizations like FIFA and so on and so forth. But there was also something about politics, too. And again, I found myself when talking to journalists about sport washing, because inevitably, inevitably, journalists in the Western world wanted to talk about sport washing. Journalists from elsewhere in the world wanted to talk about soft power. And so what I found at times, you know, I was challenged because people who wanted me to explain the World Cup in terms of sport washing weren't happy with my representation of Qatar projecting soft power. But at the same time, some journalists who wanted to talk about soft power were not happy when I raised the possibility that there, you know, maybe there are image and reputational benefits associated with hosting a tournament, which some people might call sport washing. And so the reason for giving you the personal background right at the very start of, of my presentation is, is what seemed to be happening is, is almost as though there was a binary debate. And again, one of the things that I very often um, said to people is, is how I was expected to talk about and report upon and debate the World Cup existed in very binary terms. 
And I used George W. Bush's Axis of Evil speech. And some of you may remember George W. Bush's Axis of Evil speech from early 2002. And it was either you, you, you're either with us. Professor Simon. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but we're running, we're running low on time. If you can okay, start cool. wrapping up, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. So in terms of transgression, so this was a really interesting issue. Denmark and, and Denmark shirts. One of the things that I would invite you to do if, you're, if you, you are still questioning Denmark's response to, 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 to the tournament is look at Hummel's mission statement on its website. And so it talks about Danishness. So Hummel specifically makes reference to Danishness. So for them, in protesting against what they perceived as Cathary transgression, in reality, it was a branding opportunity. It was a commercial branding opportunity. So again, in terms of seeing the world in different ways from diff different parts of the world, wherever you were, I think this is, a, this is an example. Was it transgression or was it a commercial opportunity? So what I found, my, found myself doing repeatedly is trying to conceive of a world by comparing and contrasting and getting accused of whataboutery and getting accused of trying to draw moral equivalence. So one of the things that I did was to very often think about how, how the British Empire used sport. And if we were to reappraise the British Empire and the way that the British Empire used sport in contemporary terms, we can call it sport washing, right? And one of the things I, uh, I am now very provocative in doing is to accuse Britain, both now and in the past, of being, being a sport washer. And that very often shuts down debate. But you know, the, the whole point about the George W. Bush, you're either with us or you're against, is I, for me, I like to stand in the middle and take a helicopter view. And the discourse around Qatar really, really challenged me not to do that. I was increasingly pressed to take one side or the other. So I think for me, certainly in the Western world, that that is a big issue. And I do have two slides, very quick slides, which leads me on to, the, to, to Gianni Infantino, because I think Gianni Infantino, and again, if you look at the way that Infantino's pre-tournament one-hour speech was framed by the Western media, it was as though this guy was crazy. You know, what what was he talking about? My view is he was actually making a lot of really, really important points. I don't think he made them well. I think his monologue was kind of unstructured and shambolic, and but his underlying points were very, very important. Yet in this world of, you know, you're not allowed to compare, you're not allowed to contrast, you're not allowed to draw moral equ equivalence, um, you're not about, you're not allowed to engage in what about re? Infantino was derided. But set in the context of the geopolitical economy of sport, which is a common character or a major characteristic of which is multipolarism, what we have to say, I think, is that Qatar 2022 was when the global north, not the Western world, not East and West, was when the global north experienced the, the acute pain of a pivot towards the global south. So it goes back to that first question, who decides? And I think in Norway, in Germany, in Britain, in France, in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world, we began to realise during the Qatar World Cup that perhaps we're not the ones who decide anymore. So on that note, I say thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And I guess there may be some questions later. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your discussion of this uh, paper. It was very informative, and it genuinely means a lot coming from a person with such a diverse uh, background. Well, on my... And now we go to um, uh, Professor Ian Bosse, senior researcher at the Institute of Political Science at the University of Auschwitz, Munich, Germany. And he focuses on political dynamics in the Middle East and North Africa. He's also interested in the interplay of football and politics. He has many publications 
in um, in peer reviewed journals such as Mediterranean, Mediterranean politics the Journal of International Relations and Development uh, and Middle East Critique and International Political Sociology. His paper is about regional power play, shifting political dynamics in the Middle East and North Africa in the context of Qatar's World Cup as he has described the interlink between sports and uh, geopolitics in GCC and demonstrated this uh, uh, during the rift and the uh, crisis between Qatar and its neighboring countries during the period 2017-2021. Jan Bossi. Discuss your paper. Uh, the floor is yours. Now the mic is on. Thanks for the kind introduction. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the Arab Center and in particular Dr. Haidar and his team for the very kind invitation to this exciting event and the opportunity that was given to me to speak here to you. So um, in this presentation, I would like to share with you some observations and reflections on recent geopolitical developments in the Middle East and North Africa and I want to do so by stressing the interconnectedness of these developments with football based on the idea that football and politics are always interconnected, in particular so in the moment this connection is being denied. Um, especially, I want to focus on how football is being utilized in the context of diplomacy. Focus on two recent major geopolitical incidents, namely the diplomatic blockade of Qatar and the normalization agreements between Israel and several Arab countries dubbed as the Abraham Accords. I will show that in particular the event of the World Cup served as a crucial diplomatic site in relation to both of these incidents. I will start by offering some conceptual considerations which I find relevant to grasp this matter. Then I will examine the Qatar blockade and the Abraham Accords through a focus on this interconnectedness between football and diplomacy. On this basis, I will show that the Qatar 22, um, 2022 World Cup played an important role as a diplomatic site. Finally, I will offer some um, overarching conclusions. So, conceptually, I follow recent innovative engagement with um, diplomatic studies in the field of international relations, which is my home turf, basically, um, that highlight the importance of diplomacy, both as a practice, on the one hand, and highlighting its spatial situatedness, on the other. Accordingly, both the practice and the side of diplomacy matter. And this is even more so in the case of football, I would argue, given that the beautiful game itself is a highly sophisticated and codified practice based on standardized and universalized rules. At the same time, football takes place in a particular site, the football field, with both a locally situated audience in the stadium as well as a globally reachable audience via television broadcast. And it is this audience that transforms a seemingly mundane everyday practice, namely sports, to a symbolically loaded competition of extraordinary importance. As such, therefore, the practice of professional football, most prominently exercised in world championships, is an example of the transcendence of the global and the local at a specific site, the stadium. In a similar vein, Diplomacy as a practice should not be limited only to high-level summits or bilateral relations of heads of state. Rather, also diplomacy is practiced as an everyday act in various sites. When it comes to research on diplomacy and footballs, two things stand out. First, Research on this topic in relation to the Middle East and North Africa is rather rare and mainly restricted to analysis of soft power, and we heard a lot about this today already. Um, one of the few systematic engagements with the region is presented by Stevenson and Alok, and it deals with the unification of Yemen in 1990. 
Research on the soft power of football has offered valuable insights into the relationship of football and politics, but I want to suggest that it is also worth looking at how football can play a key role in the context of different kinds of geopolitical dynamics, be they cooperative or confrontational. For this purpose, I now want to turn to the two recent geopolitical events in the region that I've just briefly introduced. So, with regards to the Qatar blockade of 2070 to 2021, I just want to briefly summarize it. So, basically, the politics of football took center stage also in the context of this blockade. But first, just to remind us of the blockade itself, in June 2017, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt initiated a comprehensive blockade against Qatar related to its airspace, land, access and waterways. And the blockading countries tried to force Qatar to completely reorient its regional politics, in particular by seizing its support for Islamic organizations, shutting down the prominent TV station Al Jazeera, and downgrading diplomatic ties to Iran. These demands were obviously so fundamental that they would have equaled an end of Qatari sovereignty. Accordingly, Qatar was not willing to give in and instead successfully found ways to circumvent the boycott eventually making the country more autonomous and resilient from its Arab neighbors. Less than two months later, in August, Qatar offered an initial response to the blockade countries. The Qatari-owned French football club Paris Saint-Germain bought Brazilian striker Neymar for 222 million euros. This remarkable transfer was not only impressive in the context of professional football as such, it also was a clear sign that Qatar is not willing to give in to the external pressures by the initiators of the blockade. Subsequently, activities aimed at disrupting Qatar's World Cup preparations and its sports infrastructure. This included the pirating of its main sports channel, Be In Sports, by broadcasting its images without permission under the name Be Out Q. Amongst others, B in Sports has also acquired the rights to broadcast matches of the English Premier League in the Arab world. Relatedly, when Saudi Arabia issued its bid for buying the Premier League club Newcastle United, the English Football Association only agreed to the deal after B out Q stopped operating. In addition, there are also indicators that the boycotting states tried to convince FIFA to expand the number of World Cup participants from 32 to 48. In 2018, FIFA president Infantino even announced this plan as an idea in public. The underlying rationale was that in terms of logistics, Qatar might not have been able to organize such a tournament with a considerable greater number of teams and also matches. As a result, while not only being able to prevent, while not being able to prevent Qatar from hosting the tournament, Saudi Arabia and the UAE could have offered their help to Qatar serving as co-hosts. While in the end this constellation did not materialize, it clearly shows that regional rivalries also played out in relation to football. In this heated environment, the UAE hosted the AFC Asian Cup in 2019. In the semi-finals, Qatari fans were not allowed to attend their team's match against the host nation due to the ongoing diplomatic crisis. In spite of that, in a rather unreceptive atmosphere, Qatar won the match against the UAE with 4-0 and also succeeded in the cup final against Japan. Eventually, Qatar also succeeded in withstanding the blockade and in January 2021, the blockade was lifted. In parallel to this diplomatic crisis, a significant diplomatic initiative had a major impact on Middle East regional politics. For the first time since 1994, Israel entered normal diplomatic relations with a couple of Arab states. United in their perception of Iran as a threat to regional security, these so-called Abraham Accords led to a normalization of diplomatic relations um, with the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco and Sudan with Israel, partially ending a decade-long isolation. 
The US under President Trump played a key role in facilitating these accords. Most notably, in order to make Morocco join the normalization agreement, the US administration offered to recognize Moroccan sovereignty claims over the Western Sahara, which, according to international law, represents an Ill illegal occupation. What is clearly missing in these Abraham Accords is any explicit consideration of the Palestine question. The Accords only indirectly touched upon this issue in so far as the EUA um, conditioned their support for the Accords to the Israeli government, giving up plans to annex occupied West Bank. This fact is particularly important because of the Arab Peace Initiative, which was first presented by the Arab League in 2002. The initiative offered Israel normal diplomatic relations, not only with the members of the Arab League, but also with the members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, in return for a peace agreement with the Palestinians. As a result, the fact that the Abraham Accords led to a diplomatic normalization between Israel and several Arab countries means that this key incentive of the Arab Peace Initiative was lost or at least severely weakened. Moreover, whereas Egypt was suspended from the Arab League for a decade after the peace treaty in 1979, there were no such consequences in the face of the Abraham Accords. Rather, the Palestinian political leadership under Mahmoud Abbas felt betrayed by the signatory states of the Accords and reacted by not assuming the Arab League's presidency in 2020. It should be noted, however, that thus far several key players among the Arab states have refrained from joining the Abraham Accords and it remains to be seen how Saudi Arabia will position itself given the most recent signs of a possible detente between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There is however clear evidence that the regional dynamics related to the Abraham Accords also had repercussions on the football field. And as I will show, the Palestine question assumed a crucial symbolic role in this context. Accordingly, regional politics also played a role during the FIFA Arab Cup in December 2021 in Qatar. The tournament was a final rehearsal for the World Cup and the semi-finals between Algeria and Morocco was not so much remarkable as it was a contest between two rivals in the Maghreb region. Algeria has supported the Western Sahara resistance movement Polisario Front since the inception of the conflict there. Rather, the match was remarkable because the Algerian players celebrated their triumph over Morocco by waving Palestinian flags. This can be seen not only as a gesture of solidarity towards the Palestinians, but it was also meant as a critique of Morocco's normalization of diplomatic relations with Israel. At the 2022 Qatar World Cup, as a particular diplomatic site, regional politics clearly played a role, both in relation to the previously strained relations between Qatar and the initiators of the blockade, as well as concerning the implications of the Abraham Accords. In the context of the preparation of the World Cup, Qatar cooperated with the UAE, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, the latter countries serving as hosts for World Cup visitors and establishing shuttle flights between these countries and Doha. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was among the senior political figures who attended the World Cup opening ceremony and the subsequent opening match. He met with Emir Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani and MBS wore a scarf with the Qatari flag. Moreover, when Saudi Arabia sensationally won against the later world champion, Argentina, TV pictures showed Emir Tamim cheering with the Saudi flag. The Abraham Accords clearly played a role during the World Cup and this was due to their neglect of the Palestine question and the remarkable success of the Moroccan team. To the great surprise of all pundits and an excited Arab but also global audience, the Moroccan team astonishingly went on a winning streak and reached the World Cup semi-finals. When Morocco won against Belgium in the group stage, the solidarity with Palestine was then limited to fans displaying a free Palestine banner, but ever since the sensational victory against Spain, the players themselves were celebrating with a Palestine flag on the field. 
Two aspects matter in my view when interpreting the display of solidarity. On the one hand, in the context of the Moroccan-Algerian rivalry, this can be interpreted as a response to the Algerian team celebrating with the Palestine flag at the FIFA Arab Cup 2021. And on the other hand, the Moroccan team's display of the Palestine flag can be seen in the context of the Abraham Accords. Accordingly, at least this was a sign that also Moroccans um, have not forgotten the Palestine question. And potentially, it may be interpreted as a critique of the Moroccan team towards the normalization of diplomatic relations with Israel. Possibly in reaction to this, in the face of the Abraham Accords, the Moroccan king has made clear that his country continues to support the Palestinian cause. To conclude, in an attempt to offer a particular conceptualization of diplomacy as a practice and a site, and um, by trying to highlight the interconnectedness of football and politics, I address several geopolitical developments. As long as regional rivalries remain or would remain restricted to the football field without reaching further diplomatic repercussions, the underlying competition between different Arab Gulf states would be domesticated and limited to the realm of sports. While this cannot be seen and is probably rather unlikely, the regional competition in the context of football and other popular sports will clearly remain a key feature of future regional relations. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much for your paper, which actually shed light to many examples that are uh, very, uh, that we actually uh, felt them in a very tangible way. And you presented uh, all your ideas in a very transparent matter. As much as we'd like to believe that politics are, and football, they're very isolated, we actually can't neglect the fact that in one way or another, they actually influence one another. Um, so thank you for uh, the presentation of your paper. Uh, and now, um, we would like to open the floor for questions, if there are any, or comments. point will address uh, the talk by uh, Simon. Is he still uh, in the audience? I'm still here. Yes. Yeah. yes uh, yeah, I uh, very much appreciate you gave us a very uh, good feeling of what does it mean uh, to have the uh, games here in Qatar. Uh, school children in the West has, have always studied history, Western civilization starting from the Greeks uh, all the way to development in Edinburgh and Scotland. Uh, now, uh, the, 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 it's really a big reorientation is that it's not Western versus Eastern, but it is really the North versus South. I appreciate that, but I want to point out to you a, a point about uh, uh, the, the vocabulary, and vocabulary is very important there is a Latin uh, uh, saying, saying nomen est numen, is that to name is to know. And so when you use, you, re, you resist using the term uh, sport washing. But sport washing is just simply the same conceptual, it is the same thing as soft power. Soft power could be seen as a euphemistic uh, term for sport washing. So really, uh, I'm a little bit puzzled is that if you resist the the word sport washing, you should also resist the word uh, soft power. Uh, soft power is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is the idea that here is a country uh, ready to spend some money in order to gain influence and to try to manipulate the, the behavior of other countries. Not through military means, but through uh, soft pressure. But uh, when uh, Sheikh Tamim addressed uh, the audience uh, at the opening ceremony, he said here, we are very happy and pleased to offer uh, Qatar and to offer the space here as a gift to the world. 
So he didn't really say, well, okay, I'm, I'm, I am spending some investments I'm, I'm, and I'm waiting for some returns. Rather, he offered it as a goodwill. And to confuse... <laughs> that uh, really uh, uh, the use of the, soft, uh, the word uh, soft power is just uh, simply sugarcoating the, uh, 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 the term sport, wa uh, sport washing. Can you please introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Elias Khalil. I teach here economics at the Doha Institute. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question in the back. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. My co um, Maria, I'm from the Arab Center. And my question is to uh, Jan. Um, and it's on the Israeli-Arab conflict and conflict and its dynamics um, in the World Cup. Um, do you think it's maybe it's too much to say that it really affects geopolitical dynamics or developments? Or maybe is it just like public opinion um, of Arab nations towards the Palestinian cause and following that how or would this display of solidarity to Palestinians will affect or if if it will affect um, uh, um, the accords or relations of those countries with Israel because we're talking about authoritarian regimes and governments that ignored and will ignore public opinion of their of their people so like showing solidarity to Palestine how would it affect um, um, question of normalization with Israel. And my other question is, how would you explain uh, not bringing up the, um, another conflict in the region, with, with it, which is the Western Sahara conflict? Um, maybe because Palestine is, uh, like, it has more, let's say it's more popular and less, like, uh, conflicted than the Western Sahara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question right there. Uh, Yama Yusuf from the Arab Center. Uh, my question is to Jan. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Uh, I, I want to ask you, <coughs> what do you, how do you, how could you define what is political? I kind of felt when you were talking about uh, the events that happened d during the uh, 2022 World Cup, uh, everything everything uh, seemed that is political. What is not political then? Uh, my second question is if uh, uh, your your thesis is that uh, we cannot divorce uh, sports from politics, that may be uh, true, but to what extent sport is political? Uh, uh, for example, and what does that say about uh, uh, the always pronounced notion that uh, sports is supposed to uh, breach the gaps and the cleavages between the societies, and uh, it's not supposed to be political and dividing uh, the people? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question here, the gentleman over here in white, please. And then we're going to conclude with your question. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Saif al Islam I'm from the Arab Center, and my question is for you. Don't you think it's quite simple? Uh, um, I, I'm adding to what Mariam have mentioned before about the Abraham Accords, or the, the things here can can affect the, the Abraham Accords. Um, it's quite simple since Netanyahu uh, said in 2016 that uh, the problem of normalization is not with the uh, with the states, is not with the with the governments. It's uh, it's with the people who uh, who resist uh, who resist it. And uh, according also to uh, what the Arab Index is is mentioning for 13 years now and uh, and on of uh, the, the people still resist the, 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 the idea of normalization and uh, uh, it's quite high in, uh, uh, in the North African uh, countries so that the, they still don't agree at all with the, uh, with the normalization. And uh, I, I believe if, if Morocco have, uh, have made like a referendum, a public referendum, fair, fair and free about their normalization, the people would have 
declined it or you know would, wouldn't have agree with the, with what happened so do you think that the 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 arab uh, governments or the, uh, some some of the arab states they get along with the with what the people uh, their people i mean uh, uh, want uh, because it's um, it's uh, it's very clear that they are in another uh, direct you know uh, this is the the the, the first uh, the first sentence and the, uh, or the first question. Uh, the second one, and I'm also getting along with the jama. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, like uh, taking the the uh, the definition of political like Carl Schmidt, who, who said everything is, is as political, but everything can be uh, functioned or can be taken and in political way, and uh, you know the governments uh, uh, can can take everything to 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 political direction. Uh, as long as what happened with Russia after uh, the Ukraine uh, Ukraine war, uh, they suspended the Russian team uh, from uh, from participating in anything. However, it's uh, it's the government issue. It's not people issue in uh, in Russia. And thank, thank you, you so much for your presentation. Thank you. And then the last question is over here. Thank you. My uh, my first uh, remark is actually uh, correcting a statement. Can we please start with your name? Aisha al-Basri from uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Uh, I would like to correct the statement my, made by uh, Jan Bous. You said that uh, according to international law, Moroccan, Morocco is the occupying power. Uh, this is not right, because according to international law, the situation of the Western Sahara is occupied by Spain. And that's why it's still examined since 1963 by the fourth committee uh, as a non-self-governing country. So the occupant power is uh, legally, according to international law, is Spain. And uh, that's why they're pushing, of course, for the self-determination. Uh, my question is to, uh, to Simon, and it's about the, uh, the, the way uh, the, the discourse has been framed. Uh, I think it's not actually about Qatar, it's about Europe. This is, this is a question I would like to hear about uh, uh, from him what he thinks about the, the idea that the, the rejection of Europeans of Qatar uh, organizing this World Cup is actually about uh, the hegemony, the, the, West, the, the Western hegemony, but most uh, specifically the Western Europe uh, hegemony of uh, sports and especially of uh, soccer. Um, and this, uh, this issue has been raised since 1970s, since the, the first non-European uh, presidents of FIFA, the, the Brazilians, Havalanche, who opened up the, the policies of FIFA to non-European and non-Latin American countries. And this, this has been uh, taken over by the, the two Swiss uh, presidents who have opened up to African countries and Asian countries. And the European countries who have been dominating the sports, which includes, of course, politics, power, and, and economy, uh, have been reacting quite severely to, to Qatar because they see uh, in, in this uh, a, a, loss, a, a loss of power and loss of hegemony over a sport that they have dominated for, for decades. So maybe um, I would like to hear from Dr. Simon if this is a really a, a, a governance issue within FIFA, uh, within the, uh, the European uh, dominance. Thank you. Uh, Professor Simon, you had the first question and you had the last question. So if you can uh, briefly answer the questions and then we'll go to Professor Jan because uh, all, all his questions are kind of interrelated in a way. So the, if I could take the first question first, seems like a good idea. Um, absolutely great that we're going to talk about a question, talk about a question that, that thinks in terms of soft power, sport washing. Uh, that's, that's the kind of debate that I think in Western Europe um, most people believe that you cannot have in Qatar. Well, very clearly, that's not true. That's a, my first reaction. Um, second reaction is, is it soft power? Is it is it sport washing? We can add into this uh, propaganda and, and the use of sport for propaganda purposes. You know, there is a long history of this. And I think uh, how we label it and how we, uh, we, we conceive of it, frame it, position it is an interesting debate. Is it sport washing? Is it soft power? Is it propaganda? Um, third thing in relation to that is there is a literature, uh, an ex existing literature, an established literature on soft power. There isn't on, on um, sport washing. 
And, and what's really significant, we've now started to see some studies emerging from the Western world on sport washing, and it's framed in a particular way. The the there is a a, a discussion currently: is is sport washing a media construct, or does it really exist? Um, it's not been empirically tested. Um, the other thing that I would say, the fourth thing in regards to the first question, the final thing in regards to the first question is, okay, let's imagine Qatar is sport washing. Is Britain, is the United States, is China, and so on and so forth. And, and so the consistent application of the terms of reference of, ter of, of concepts like sport washing need to be applied universally, not just in the context of one particular country. On the second question, the question that came at the end, and, and can I just say, but fantastic, both questions, really fantastic questions. This is part of my, my if you like, my thesis, my argument, and, and, and the book that I, I've talked about that will be published soon. This is, in essence, um, what I discuss is, is, is I think we've, we've, we've seen a pivot already in elite professional sport from Europe to North America. A lot of the institutions, the systems of governance that we have in global sport now are European, established late 19th, early 20th centuries. They were challenged by a pivot towards North America post-war. Now, keep in mind that the National Basketball Association didn't exist until 1951. So second, second half or maybe fourth quarter 20th century sport and first decade 21st century sport, systems of governance, um, the models we, the, the models adopted by professional sports were more North American in orientation. We're now having another pivot away from this kind of 19th century European, 20th century North American towards a more 21st century global geopolitical, more kind of globally North, globally South shift. And and this is causing some issues, especially for for Europeans, and 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 just to highlight your point about Europeans, uh, if we take uh, FIFA for example, FIFA has only ever had two non-Europeans as president. One of those, uh, Issa Hayatu, was uh, was a temporary president. So in in essence, uh, you you, you uh, FIFA has only ever had one full time non-European president, and that was Havalange from Brazil. Um, that is not reflective of the 21st century world. So we are getting a pivot and, and Europe's hegemony, its power, its influence is being challenged. And if we want some cross-validation of this, look at what's now happening in the FIA, the world governing body of motorsport. Because what Qatar has just been through, and I think continues to go through, if we, we think about Qatari influence on, for example, um, the European Clubs Association, what we're seeing in motorsport, and as I say, the FIA, the world governing body, it now has its first non-European president who is from Kuwait. And he seems to want to, to do things in a very different way. And there's been huge outcry amongst many Europeans about what we're now seeing within the FIA, because again, I think what it essentially it is doing, it's bringing a different worldview it's bringing a different ideology. It's bringing a different set of values. It's bringing, in very simple terms, a different perspective on how global motorsport should be. So this goes back to my presentation. I think Qatar was uh, Qatar 2022 was almost a, a tipping point for many people in Europe because there was this realization. And I think the outcry was the pain. The outcry was the pain of this realization that we're not in control anymore. And this will continue, not, not just you know, in the coming years, I think it will continue throughout the 21st century. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Simon. Um, now we go to Mr. Jan. You have a set of questions and we have roughly 10 minutes, 12 minutes to answer all questions, so good luck. Yeah, maybe we also have time for a second round of um, questions. So first of all, um, Aisha, thank you very much for um, giving more precision to my side remark on the Western Sahara. I did not mean to imply um, that it's occupied in this specific constellation under international law, but uh, my focus in the talk was not on Western Sahara. So when it comes to the Israeli-Arab conflict, um, the first question was, 
do we see just um, um, a superficial effect or, or a real one? That's, that's how I would frame it. And um, how does it affect the situation on the ground? Well, um, probably it, it is um, very um, pessimistic to, to see the situation there currently on the ground, uh, I would say, um, on, um, on both sides, um, in terms of the political developments. And um, the um, publicity the Palestinian cause received during the World Cup was maybe the, a, a certain um, response to the Abraham Accords in Sofa, as it is a very good example for this decoupling between um, political leaderships and their populations, um, which of course is um, problematic, but, but um, also prone to, to conflict. So I, I would not underestimate the power of the people. And I would say that especially um, King Mohammed of uh, Morocco, he was eager to express his committedness to um, the Palestinians when he realized, okay, well, um, maybe the Moroccan population is not such a big fan of these accords as I am. Um, in addition, I would say we already witnessed um, that there were that, that the um, especially the United Arab Emirates are very closely watching what is happening um, in terms of the conflict around Jerusalem. So, um, as a Muslim country, of course, um, it, it cannot be accepted from their point of view um, when there are clashes erupting around Haram al Sharif. And I would say this could also strain um, the Abraham Accords, the normalization of diplomatic relations, but this remains to be seen. Um, in connection to this, um, I think you, you said, um, Netanyahu said, normalization is, um, is with the people, or this is important. I think this was an insight from um, the peace agreements we had um, between Israel and Egypt and also Israel and Jordan in 1994 and the previous one, 1979, because it has remained until to date what is called a cold peace. So it is a peace on, on a diplomatic level. It is about security cooperation and a calm border, but that's it. So there is no exchange or even more um, among the populations. And the impression is that right now the instigators of the diplomatic normalization initiative want to change this. And um, the Israeli Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, he said he wants to be this a warm peace. And my impression is that this is also the intention of, of the um, other, the Arab signatories of the accord. So, um, for instance, um, there is this Museum of um, the Civilizations, I think it is called, in Dubai. And they also exhibited um, a piece of, of an ancient um, Jewish text, the Torah. So. In, in, in an attempt maybe to educate the population. So I think even though these um, governments are not responsive to um, their um, population in terms of um, democratic elections, they are still responsive in the sense that they need a certain degree of support of their um, directions. Um, why was this Western Sahara conflict neglected? I guess it was neglected because it has been even more neglected than um, the Israeli-Arab conflict, um, which is of course unfortunate, but um, um, in addition, I guess, um, Morocco was quite um, eager to get this topic even vis-a-vis to, -vis the European Union off the table um, after Trump um, recognized um, Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara. So um, I guess this is an issue in this regard. And I, I would say um, the, the status of the Palestinians is also um, gradually better, if you may say so, in many respects. So they are a non-member state, non-member observer state in the United Nations. And for instance, of course, they are also recognized by international sporting bodies. And I come to this later, but first, how do you define what is political? I guess this would be, um, a topic for a lecture series, but uh, my short answer would be um, I indeed um, would follow um, the research from Michel Foucault who, who would say um, power is not everything but is everywhere, um, in potentially in any kind of um, social relations from the macro structural level of international politics to the micro level of interpersonal relations and of course it depends on the context and you have to look at this specific context. And um, to what extent is sports political? I would say um, 
sports becomes political in the moment um, it has an audience or it is directed towards an audience. And I would see two major um, dynamics in this regard. First, um, it can have repressive features, as with um, Professor Chadwick said, in terms of the British Empire, which is why I also would say it was not sports washing, because there was not really such a big audience, but this is uh, maybe a topic for another discussion. Um, and on the other hand, there is um, the feature of sports as being um, an tool of empowerment and um, you can find this in very many different respects, be it in the anti-colonial struggle in Algeria or the ultras um, so fans um, supporting the Arab uprisings against Hosni Mubarak in 2011 and so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to um, the normalization agreements in general, I don't recall um, the question exactly, I'm sorry, but it, it was related to the question, people still resist the idea of normalization. I would say in principle, it will, would be good for the region if there was normalization, under the condition that it um, is concomitant with um, a two-state solution and peace with the Palestinians. Because this would mean that there is um, an important conflict that has an effect on the region as a whole being solved and the chance for um, greater regional collaboration and cooperation. But at the moment, this is um, even more than unrealistic, of course. Um, when it comes to um, the, um, the question um, of Russia, so um, after um, 2014, etc., um, there, there were sanctions. Um, I think they were related not to the Crimea annexation, but be because of um, doping manipulations. Um, and now we had the situation that um, athletes were suspended from the Tokyo Olympics, if I'm not wrong. I think the interesting thing is we, I think we, we tend to be too much fixed towards um, a framework of seeing the world in um, as structures in, in states. So of course, the World Cup is crucial for Qatar, and Qatar exercised successfully a lot of um, soft power in this context. And Russia is a problem in many respects as well. But we should not neglect that the world um, sports federations themselves are actors um, in global governance. So um, when the International Olymp Olympic Committee will decide allowing Russian athletes to compete in, in Paris next year. They will do this um, not because of Russia, but because they want to have successful games and um, just make a lot of money. And I would say this is also the rationale behind um, what Gianni Infantino is doing. He just tries to find the lowest common denominator for everybody so that um, FIFA can make billions and billions of dollars. And um, in this sense, I would say we have a very interesting emancipation of this world um, sports federations from powerful nation states. And um, Professor Chadwick is right that this mirrors multipolarity. Also, when you look at the countries that were hosts of Olympics and World Cups, it's almost BRICS, except of India. So we have cricket and hockey in India, maybe sooner or later also a football World Cup. But as you can see, basically, um, these organizations um, have a life on their own. And of course, they um, um, enter a symbiotic relationship with the host countries. But in the end, I would say they are always the winners, regardless of where um, a World Cup or Olympic Games are taking place. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we have four minutes. Um, Dr. Simon, I'm going to give you a minute and a half, and I will give uh, Mr. Jan uh, a minute and a half. If you guys, you guys can just sum up just a minute of, and a half of up or any remarks or any note you'd like to give towards the end of our talk today. Dr. Simon? Um, thank you for giving me the first opportunity to do that. I, I mean, firstly, it's just to say thank you to everybody uh, for, for, for being in the audience and for the questions and, and also to, for, to, to the Arab Centre for organising this. Um, I, I re reiterate again the fact that people publicly are talking about very controversial issues. Um, I, I wish, you know, in some ways you could make a Netflix box, box, series, box set series out of this and, and show it in the Western world, um, because I think there is still a belief even now um, that uh, you can't discuss contentious issues in public. Um, otherwise, I, I think we do live in a, in a rapidly changing world. We are seeing a pivot 
what the precise nature of that pivot is uh, requires us to discuss in more detail, I think, um, who holds power and what and on what basis and how do they exercise that power. Um, otherwise, beyond that, I think obviously the conversation about sport in particular, um, what a lot of people in Europe and the Western world need to realise is, is that sport is not necessarily just sport, is that it is a policy instrument that is dis that is deployed it's a means to an end and and that's not just a reflection upon the qatar world cup but i think increasingly upon the role that play that sport plays in the 21st century generally and if i could just round round uh, round up um, by going back to something that i said earlier and, and trying to tie up a few loose ends at the same time um last weekend as i've already mentioned uh, um, gary lineker was uh, removed from BBC TV coverage for having made um, a statement on Twitter about migrants who come to Britain on boats across the, uh, the channel. Um, at the same time as that statement was made, uh, outside the, the uh, British Embassy in Paris, there's a huge banner that says, uh, sport is great. So the British government has had this communications campaign running now for you know, kind of five, six years of sport is great. So what we're doing is we're using sport is great. And, and, and on the French embassy in, in Paris, sorry, the Brit English British embassy in Paris, a picture of a Premier League footballer. Whilst at the same time, we, we are as a country denying the opportunity of people to speak freely about contentious, contentious issues. Thank you so much, sport? Dr. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is that sport washing? <laughs> so I need to think we need a much broader and fairer and more consistent debate about the kind of things that I talked about a little earlier today. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Um, doc, uh, Professor or Mr. Young? Yeah, um, by means um, of conclusion, I just want to share a very brief observation that puts um, things maybe in another interesting perspective. So. Um, I would say, regardless of um, how justified um, criticism towards um, Qatar was in terms of um, the bidding for the World Cup or also the situation um, here, um, what I found very interesting um, in the run-up to the World Cup 2022 in Germany was that the debate opened up to a certain extent in the sense that um, Germany also questioned its own 26 um, World Cup, um, which took place in Germany. So um, we, we realized, okay, what we did was also kind of nation branding. I, I think it's a better term than sports washing because sports washing means something had to be dirty in the first place, and I think that wasn't the case in Qatar. Um, but in Germany, we, we had this branding, time to make friends. Okay, we are not the serious warmongering Germans anymore, but the world can come to our country and we are open-minded and friendly. And apparently um, this worked out. So it was also part of a soft power campaign we um, were witnessing there. And only now this was reflected that th this is just part of the game. Why would you host a World Cup without um, not using these opportunities? It's totally legitimate to do so. But um, it's certainly also legitimate to discuss it. And it was interesting to see this in the aftermath. Um, so much time after the World Cup took place, um, at least there was a certain debate of, about this also in Germany. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Simon Chadwick and to thank Mr. Jan Bossa for your contributions. They were very appreciated, very informative. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank everyone for being with us and your discussions. Uh, and I would like to thank the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies for uh, providing us with this opportunity. Well, and, and, we, and now we leave the floor to Dr. Haider Saeed for his concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Aisha, for moderating this session. We have to close. Uh, however, in a few minutes, I would like to say a couple of brief points. I would like to congratulate the researchers for this educating 
uh, seminar. This has been a very successful and uh, relevant and it went exactly as we have planned. The concept of this seminar came along uh, after the final match in Qatar World Cup 2022. I personally thought of this pre before the Mundial and post the FIFA World Cup. I don't want to talk about myself. I never imagined that the FIFA World Cup 2022 would 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 create such a, such a, such a big and intense cultural debate and therefore the planning for this seminar started immediately after the final match and we have decided to schedule it on this date in the middle of March and now I believe we don't want to steer away uh, from the FIFA World Cup. However, if we conducted this seminar in April, May or June, wouldn't uh, lose its significance because this discussion would continue. Also, I believe that the nature of discussion and, and maybe Dr. Mahfouz in their sports studies, maybe they know better, it this this transcends uh, um, sports and its political and social aspects. We are talking about an event that was placed in the heart, in the core of a cultural debate, and and it has contributed to crystallizing such a debate. The next step, I believe, I believe one of the participants said that we would publish the portfolio of papers in both Arabic and English and there would be a time for the researchers to submit their papers in its final format and at the Arab Center um, in the occasion of the uh, FIFA World Cup, we have made two publications about sports and society and culture and we are considering seriously to uh, issue a book uh, as the Arabic literature are quite poor in this area contrary to thousands of books that were published in this area. Hmm. Finally, I would like to thank the professors, the gentlemen, the researchers who traveled to Doha honoring us with their presence and those who presented virtually via Zoom, Dr. Honestad and Dr. Simon Chadwick. And I hope that we would meet them very soon. I would also like to thank my colleagues without whom we wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't the seminar be a reality. Fadia Nassar, who was the for at the forefront uh, and my colleague Abdurrahman al Bakr and my colleagues at the events department al aqad Mu'taz al nadir and the technical staff Ibrahim Abdul Jawad, Amir Saad and as well as the interpreter Dr. Uh, Mr. Muwafak and his team and uh, uh, hoping that uh, we would document the works of this uh, uh, seminar in the future and thank you very much.